we'll now open it up to the floor, and if there's any questions that some of you were thinking you might ask or might not ask. I think we've got kids when we've done that. Um, Let's well, start up over here. Philip? I have uh, two questions, sort of related. Um, like Brad, I also sat on a jury and read lots of plays a few years ago. And what amazed me about the plays was they were all plot. They didn't have any interesting characters. And the characters they had all sounded the same, whether it was oh, an 85-year-old yes. woman yeah. and her 15-year-old granddaughter, and the woman was born in Yugoslavia and the daughters from St. Albert or whatever. They all sounded the same. So the question I have, uh, and it kind of gets back to your point, Brad, is at what point, or maybe Drew could also have, you decided to do a story about life on the reservation, or reservation schools. Okay, there's a whole pile of those, but somewhere along the line you found some characters that made it worthwhile, and you imagined them with such force that a play evolved. So can you talk, any of you, about what that relationship is of, of the plot, the storyline, to the characters. Because if we don't have the right balance between the two, as you pointed out, we've got nothing. Um, well, I wish I had an easy answer for you, but I don't. Uh, one of the most frequent questions I get asked is, do you base your characters on real people? And I always say no. I, I tried that once, and I found it bogged me down. Um, I don't know. <sighs> You know, one of the first rules of writing is, is is know your characters as well as you know your best friend. And because these <coughs> stories sit with me for a year and I'm, I'm driving or I'm in a conversation with my partner over there and all of a sudden I'll sort of go off, I'll trigger something and I'll be thinking about, okay, they could say this and do that. And, and I, I, it just develops organically. I don't have a formula for creating individual characters. It's just, I try to make them um, as four-dimensional, three-dimensional, two-dimensional, whatever turn, however dimensions you believe in, as um, as I as I possibly can, and I don't have a, a right formula to tell you. I just sit down, try to put my mind. One of the one of the weirdest plays I ever wrote as as a writer, putting myself in my characters, is I wrote a play with a central character with a pregnant woman, and that was fun to do. Sure. Yeah, I I think story always has to come out of character, and if you know what your character wants and what they're not able to achieve and how much they want it, then you start to unlock what the story is about. But if, you're, if your character doesn't have a really strong objective for the play, you're probably going to bore us. And I think that the, the journey of the characters and what they need will start to give you what the events are and how things happen. But addressing the problem of everybody speaking the same way, which I will say was a huge issue with the plays I just read, Again, that goes back to my original point about advice for playwrights and everybody else, is listen. Listen to people and how they speak. People in different jobs speak different ways. People from different classes speak different ways. People at different ages, different sexes. We all have a unique way of speaking, whether it's in the rhythm, whether it's in the, the words we choose, whether it's the way we project our voice. Everybody has that, and you have to be just even more specific with that on the stage than anything else, because there's nothing more boring than going to a play with a lot of diverse characters who all speak the same way. But again, part of the problem with that is we have this model of sort of the well-made American mid-20th century play where there wasn't a lot of focus on individualizing the voices, but it's always about sort of the characters and what happened in the past and this whole kind of past tense thing going on that takes us farther and farther away from it. And that's why I get nervous when I start reading a play and the language is too poetic. If one character is really poetic, Great, but when everybody's really poetic, you're writing a poem, you're not writing a play. So, you know, it really means knowing your characters and knowing what they want, and I think that's the first step to unlocking what the plot and what the events are going to be. One of the things I like to do is I like to give my characters triggers. Something or a, a topic or something that will set them off. And the more triggers I give them, not that they're always dealing with anger or anything like that, but... What's that? Nothing. Okay, just things that... that that affect them specifically, but not the other characters, is a fun way to begin. But I get back to your original question, you have people like Thompson Highway. Uh, Thompson's <laughs> original career path was to be a classical pianist. And so when he sits down and he writes his characters, he gives them a type of music. So he writes their dialogue in the rhythm of a type of music. So they all do sound differently because he hears 
their dialogue musically. Yeah. If I can add, well, sorry. I was just going to add, uh, like, there are many different ways to create character, and, and my problem is I, um, I, I'm addicted to a very scientific method of creating character. I, um, and I'll tell you why in a second. Like, when I create characters, I'll often, like, you know, I'll think about the play, and I'll think about the ideas, and then something will trigger in my mind about a character and a character trait or something. And then I'll go and I have a form on my computer where it, with, that lists different characteristics and character traits like name, weight, height, birth, place, father, mother, brother, sister, uh, physical disabilities, unit allergies, likes, dislikes, whatever. And I just, it's something that I actually, I just like doing. Not everybody should do it. It's not, I'm not suggesting everybody do it. But I just, I have a fetish about it. And I, I do. And so I, I like sort of getting a lot of deal, really intricate detail about characters. And one of the most important details is primary and secondary objective. To me, like, I have to know what does the character want? Like, whatever that is, it could be a chocolate bar, it could be to save the world, it could be to rescue his princess, I don't care what, or rescue her prince or whatever, I don't care. But I just, have, that's one of the essential things that I'm trying to hone in on. Um, uh, 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 and once you have that, then your character, once you plug that character into play and it's got a life and a history and a world and a drive, then it's a lot easier for that character to be distinct. Um, and the reason why I'm addicted to it, I'll tell you, because I used to play role-playing games because I'm a geek, okay? <laughs> I used to play Dungeons and Dragons and I'm not afraid to admit it. And I love playing it because it was a role-playing game and I'm an actor, so I like playing roles. <laughs> And what got me, it's funny, because I didn't always do this, but after a while, I remember, because I started writing, and then I would go back to playing role-playing games, and I noticed I was spending more time figuring out the history of my half-elf with the plus-two halberd. I was spending more time working on that guy than working on the characters in my play. And so I just, and I realized that I just have a fetish about that. I just love doing it, role-playing games. So, and so you don't have to do what I do, but... The more specific you are, the more you know the character, the easier it's going to be. Yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And if they have a drive, they have something.